I'm going to begin my message today in 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 12. With Pentecost now hours away, I, I didn't want to trample too badly on what I'm certain will be a couple of very fine messages tomorrow. Um, but let's, let's pick it up here in 1 Corinthians 2 and read what Paul writes here in chapter 12. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know, perceive uh, with our senses, discern, understand, when you look up that word, the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, I originally set out to prepare this message uh, contrasting those two spirits, uh, but the topic took a bit of a turn for me uh, as I began to dig into it, um, and uh, as with a lot of uh, study work that we tend to do, uh, you move from maybe a 45 to 50 minute message to about three hours, and you're like, okay, that's not going to work. And so uh, I've narrowed it down a bit. And we'll, we'll sti still get a, a bit of contrast in this message, but we'll be more focused on what effect God's Spirit is to have on His church. And I, I believe this passage and the principle it speaks to is an important connector to the day of Pentecost, as we heard earlier uh, from the first message. I also know that the context that uh, Paul wrote this passage in was uh, quite different than I had seen before. Uh, typically, uh, this is a passage that we have heard read many, many times, and often we go there and pick that passage out, and we don't really look at the context that that passage uh, is nestled in amongst there. Uh, as you Bible scholars know, context is very important when we read anything, uh, but especially as it pertains to our scriptural understanding. I'll share with you a quote from Lenski's uh, Bible commentary on the meaning of the term spirit of the world, and we'll just dive right in to the scholastics of it. Uh, I don't want to waste any time, uh, and I don't want to keep you too long today. Um, Lenski's commentary says the term signifies, the term spirit of the world, signifies that which constitutes the specific character of a man, that is, of the ego that is in him. The world spirit is thus that which, that which animates the world, lends its destructive character to the world. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Lends its distinctive character character to the world. Could, could mean the other two. It's what makes the world the world. Because of this, the world ever loves its own spurious wisdom. We see this spirit fully illustrated in the world's leaders who crucify Christ. This spirit of the world is not the faculty of reason created in man, though this spirit of the world frightfully abuses this faculty. This spirit is received. This spirit is received. Men get it from the world by birth and by every kind of contact in their life. It char its characteristic marks uh, its characteristic mark is the fact that it is of the world. And then they finish off here, and they say, as long as a man has this spirit, he is unfit to receive the Holy Spirit's revelation. Reference 1 Corinthians 2.14. The worldly man despises the wisdom of God. Webster's Dictionary comments on this term spirit of the world as well. Uh, they say scholars have long maintained that each era has a unique spirit, a nature or a climate that sets it apart from all other epochs. In German, such a spirit is known as Zeitgeist. 
from the German word Zeit, meaning time, and Geist, meaning spirit. Um, even Wikipedia chimes in here, and I thought they did a pretty decent definition here. Zeitgeist is the dominant set of ideals and beliefs that motivate the actions of the members of a society at a particular period of time. I'll read that again. Zeitgeist is, a, is the dominant set of ideals and beliefs that motivate the actions of the members of a society at a particular period of time. If there's one word or term that kind of encapsulates the spirit of the world or the zeitgeist, if you will, of today, it's the word populism. Populism. Now, this word can be traced back to the early 1900s, and it's a very uh, prevalent part of our culture today. Uh, if we're not careful, we can fall into this zeitgeist, this, uh, this movement, if you will, of today. Uh, I know I've tossed out a few words or terms at you, and, we'll, and I know that uh, you're probably not familiar with all of them. Hang in there. I have some uh, info uh, from both the Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica on the term populism that I'll that I've kind of meshed together to kind of give us a, an idea of what populism is. Populism is a mode of political communication that proposes that the common people are exploited by a privileged elite and seeks to resolve this. The main ideology of the populace can be either left, right, center, politically, doesn't matter, Populism's goal is uniting the uncorrupt, simple-minded person against the corrupt, dominant elites, usually established politicians and their army of followers, usually the rich and influential. So populism is guided by the belief that political and social goals are best achieved by the direct action of the masses. Although it chiefly comes into being where mainstream political institutions are perceived to have failed to deliver. So why, why are we talking about this? Why is this important? I think as I read through this, uh, your minds probably thought about the culture uh, we have seen rise up in a very loud way, uh, in a very kind of in-your-face way recently. Uh, possibly you thought about ways the church, and maybe even you personally have been affected by this spirit of the world, this ideology that uh, constantly paints with a wide brush that governmental authority is always corrupt and that the common people should be in control. Uh, we in the Church of God are, are certainly influenced more than we realize by the world we live in. We know that um, as we read scripture and we look maybe outside the window of our lives to the world, we see the contrast constantly. Um, we are, you know, fire hose today. Uh, assaulted, if you will, with the world's views through the so-called news media, no matter where you turn, uh, a bias, uh, an agenda-based entertainment, uh, media, uh, music, uh, theater, uh, TV, radio, even YouTube, Twitter, you name it, all sources of media of this world offer a worldly perspective. Eventually, we find someone, I think most of us are the same, eventually we find someone or some organization that speaks to maybe our thought process or our slant and maybe our family background. Um, and then the danger of finding those sources is that our guards go down. And Satan finds a way to 
kind of pour that spirit of the world into our minds and begin to corrupt our thought processes and cause us to think thoughts and take actions that are just simply not godly. Uh, churches succumb to uh, worldly influences ever since I uh, can recall being a part of it. Um, flaws in governance and abuses of authority has in some cases been pretty easy to spot and pretty easy to point out. And sometimes we have seen this go on for years. Um, sometimes we can wonder, uh, you know, am I the only one that sees this? Why is nobody else seeing this? Sometimes we have struggled with that. I personally have uh, battled with this in my life, as I know many of you have. Yet with the Spirit of God, as 1 Corinthians 2.12 speaks of, uh, we can fight against this spirit of the world because His Spirit helps us understand, perceive, discern, and using His nature, His Spirit, uh, that he freely gives us, allows us to make distinctions and discern. The Corinth church had a, a serious, serious problems, as we've discussed before, uh, serious issues of zeitgeist, if you will, uh, being swayed, buying into, adopting uh, dominant ideals of the time, uh, beliefs of their time in the world. Uh, the city of Corinth was known for uh, sexual immorality, and Paul, in the Spirit of God, chastened them for essentially adopting the spirit of the world around them. And uh, he chastened them for doing that rather than dwelling in the Spirit of God and, and uh, being lawful, being mindful of God's laws. For those of us who've attended uh, the Worldwide Church of God years ago, we know some of the worldly influence of populism, uh, this heavy-handed type governance, and sometimes a lack of care and respect for, that, for others existed. And we know that's not of God, and yet it has caused a certain amount of distrust over the years in leadership. Uh, some through the years have come to the conclusion that they do not trust organized religion at all. And yet what has happened, more often than not, is that that attitude has created a disorganized religion in their lives. I'm not trying to paint anyone with some broad brush. It's not my purpose today to pick on anyone, but to simply show we can react to negative things that happen in the church by then adopting a worldly view of our own. And then we can create a scenario, if you will, where two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, one of the scriptures that, take, that, that some take out of context is 1 John 2, verse 27, if you turn over there. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. Some have said in response to religious populism, if you will, um, hey, don't, we don't need anyone to teach us. We have the Spirit of God in us. And I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, uh, 1 John 2, and verse 27, and I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation because, again, the, the wording here is a little more modernized for us. It says, but you have received the Holy Spirit, and it lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. In a word, that's populism. Hey, we don't, we don't need any leadership. We have the Spirit of God. Uh, even those through the years that have stayed in the organized churches of God, there is a tendency for some to suspect hidden agendas in every policy that comes down the line, maybe policies especially that you may not like. Um, it's easy for us to be suspicious and expect the worst 
um, based on maybe some of our past experiences. Uh, the once bitten, twice shy syndrome um, certainly comes into play. Now, when we have been through situations where outcomes have been less than godly, if we're truthful, we tend to be more cautious, don't we? Uh, some of the youngest among us uh, might have the perspective that there has been nothing but problems in the churches of God, and much of that perspective may come from us parents uh, who have maybe overshared the negative and undershared the positive of living God's way of life inside the church. Uh, personally, I understand why bad things happen. Uh, even in the church, it's human. It's succumbing to the spirit of the world, the zeitgeist of the times, if you will, that influence our carnal thought, uh, that carnal process, and that carnal reasoning. We all have to be better at this. We all have to be better at this. And we have to be careful that the spirit of the world doesn't creep in and interrupt the spirit of God in the church. Now, I would say in the 58 years I've been alive, almost 59, eesh, uh, there has been some awesome people I've grown up with in the faith, awesome people that have been a brother and a sister to me in the faith. And while there has been challenges keeping the spirit of the world uh, out of the church and out of my belief system, uh, many of you have fought through those same challenges through the years, and you have sat here for years in that battle. And uh, you have sat alongside some pretty spectacular people who have kept a right mindset. And it's not easy. It's not an easy fight. What does this have to do with the day of Pentecost? Back in Acts 2, which uh, will probably be read tomorrow some more, uh, it's when the Holy Spirit was first given on a, on a wider scale basis to those whom God called. And Pentecost was not just about the giving of the Holy Spirit, of God's Spirit, but that this action caused the formation of the body of Christ, the organized religion, the beginning of the New Testament church. God didn't call us individually and, and then say, well, here's my spirit, good luck, and I hope I see you in the kingdom. Um, he called us into an organized religion, into his church. Now, I know there's a, there's a spiritual body and a physical, more corporate organization, but the New Testament formation of the church involves organizational structure, roles, and responsibilities to aid in its function as God inspired mainly Peter and Paul to write about, and yes, even a certain amount of hierarchy. There's a, a, one of those words that people kind of grimace at today. They even included a certain amount of hierarchy. And by hierarchy, I mean people placed in positions of authority over others. And the Apostle Paul, uh, for instance, was over uh, Timothy and Titus. Uh, it was not authoritarianism. There's a difference, but it was not every man for himself. God is a God of order. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.40, Paul instructs that all things in the church should be done with decency and order. In his body, with decency and order. And I believe we're mature enough uh, spiritually to be mindful of how we do what we do and why we do what we do. Let's turn to Ephesians 4. We were there earlier in the earlier message. Ephesians chapter 4. 
In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, Paul explains that God gives certain people spiritual gifts for the purpose of bringing unity to the church. Uh, it makes sense that there's a, uh, there's a number of needs that the church has, uh, both at a congregational level and organizational level, to help it run smoothly and as a unit, as a cohesive unit. So God gives uh, gifts to certain people to fill roles for the purpose of, he says, edifying the body and bringing unity. Let's begin in verse 1 of Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. We heard this earlier, uh, but we'll read a little more. And we heard earlier, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all. And in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So Paul's driving this oneness point home in this scripture. But in verse 3, God says we must endeavor to keep unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, the word endeavor, the word endeavor kind of sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? It lends itself to saying, mm, there's, there's a roll up your sleeves moment here in this. Uh, God gives us individually different spiritual gifts. Uh, not everyone has the same gifts. But the challenge for us is to know who we are, to know our strengths and weaknesses, to know the talents, the gifts that God has given, and then be able to fit them into the body. Endeavoring, again, using that word endeavoring to use our gifts to produce unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12. We'll come back to uh, Ephesians 4 a little later. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and again, I'm going to jump to the New Living Translation uh, for uh, 1 Corinthians 12, just to modernize the language a bit. Uh, we're going to go to another one of Paul's writings on this topic. <clears throat> Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 4, says, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Uh, terminology here in the New Living Translation, it's really nice. It's uh, easy to, for us to understand. This is uh, what, what Paul just wrote and what we just read leaves you feeling kind of nice about our participation here. Down in verse 12, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Uh, it's no secret. Our backgrounds are really different. Um, we can sit down and talk about what was kind of brought up earlier. Uh, second generation Christians, I kind of feel like Brett, were kind of dull. Like, we didn't have that life-changing moment. Well, we kind of did. It was just broke up in little pieces all through our life, right? 
But you talk to first gens, and there was a beam of light coming out of the sky. And, and I don't mean to make fun of that. It, it was spectacular, the calling of God. But many of us come from different backgrounds. And we bring into the church different perspectives. And yet, the challenge is that we are to be one body and be in one spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make, make it any less part of the body. And if an ear says, I am not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? The whole body, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand can never say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. You know, there's such great lessons here in humility and respect and how we treat each other in the body and how our gifts and talents and abilities that God has amplified, that God has given us, fit together, molded together. Paul is speaking to how God views these things. To combat the zeitgeist, if you will, of the day. This class or status mindset that lent itself to an attitude of populism. Verse 26, in one part, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Now it gets a little more specific here. Paul kind of zeroes in a little tighter. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in languages or different languages. And it says unknown languages in most of the Bible translations, which is really not accurate. It's more dif uh, different languages. <clears throat> if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you know people who can speak multiple languages, well, I think we have a few in this congregation, uh, I think most of us would say that's a gift uh, because I have trouble with the English language. And that's the one I've known my whole life, at least. Uh, my mother would say I should have known it. Um, she was always on me about it. So, you know, the, the talent, the gift of being able to learn different languages and kind of have a, a, a predisposition for that um, doesn't come to everybody. Um, by the way, uh, when Paul is listing these first, second, and third, I don't, I don't believe it's talking about some hierarchical rank but rather how Christ set the church in order. He started with the disciples and the 12 who became apostles out of that mass of disciples. And God had order, and Jesus Christ carried out that order. Um, verse 29, so we are all, or are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak uh, in different languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret different languages? Paul says, of course not. 
Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And then we move into chapter 13, which we know is what we kind of label as the love chapter. Um, the, you know, the, the key to contributing to the unity of the body is purposefully developing and using your gifts in godly love to edify and build up the body. That's what you've been called to. That's what I've been called to. Let's turn back to Ephesians 4, if you will. <clears throat> we'll finish up where we left off. Um, and again, there, there'll be a little bit of redundancy here in Paul's writings, um, but let's read it. Uh, pick it up in verse 10 of Ephesians 4. He who descended is also the one who ascended uh, far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of of the body of Christ. Each role, <clears throat> each role in the body is different and adds something that, that God intends to edify and work toward unity of the faith. Um, there are different roles even in the structure of the church, and God places individuals where he sees fit. Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Again, contrasting this spirit of the world. Have there been abuses of roles and authority in the church? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, there has. In fact, I would wager every one of us probably have a story to tell, whether we were personally involved or whether we were at arm's length and saw it. The problem isn't the God-ordained structure. The problem is the people in the structure. So if we have an unfortunate experience, we need to remind ourselves it is not what God put in place. It's the people working in that structure that have the issues. That should not be a surprise to us because we've been called out of the world and we know that God is working with us to put sin and the worldly thoughts and ways of doing things out of our life. A, sig a significant part of the meaning of the day of Pentecost is the importance of the church and the structure God has given it. To remember that it's a great blessing to be a part of the body of Christ, especially when it works as God intended. It's a great joy. Again, this doesn't always work perfectly. I'm not saying that it does. Uh, God has provided the structure but he's filled it with imperfect human beings. It doesn't matter what leadership role a person is given, uh, a leader can abuse that authority. Definition of authoritarianism is the enforcement of, I'm sorry, sorry, the enforcement or advocacy of strict obedience to authority at the expense of personal freedom, as well as lack of concern for the wishes or opinions of others. This is what leads people to populism. People feel like they're not being listened to and they're being maybe micromanaged. God's not the author of that. There's a big difference between God-given authority and authoritarianism. The answer is not to adopt 
populism and throw away the structure, especially the structure that God's put in place to feed and care for his people. In the face of these things, we need to be, in verse 15 of Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love. We grow up in all things into him who is head, Christ. You know, that's such a powerful principle. Yet most of the time, we, we don't practice them both together very well. If everything was said that was truthful, and it was also spoken with love, we would have a lot more peace and unity in the body. Both of those connect, and they work together to produce the kind of unity and peace in the body that God has desired through this structure. Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Saying we all have a strategic, important part to play in this. And God's Spirit gives us the ability to work together to accomplish a godly outcome. Let's take it one step further. The Bible also records examples of involvement of all members in decision-making process in the church. Our official policy in the church is uh, consensus leadership. Uh, we get this model from uh, many scriptures, but let's, let's turn to Acts 6. For an example um, that I, I think I read from recently uh, concerning consensus leadership, but we'll go back there and we'll revisit this. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint about the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I will say when I read this, uh, one of the things that I've struggled with uh, is the amount of time it takes me to give myself to what, what the scripture says, continual prayer for all the members and the studying and teaching of God's word. Um, in my uh, naivety, uh, I, I never realized the amount of time that this took a pastor. Uh, it was pretty easy in Portland, a deacon or an elder. It was easy for me to, uh, in my spare time, uh, help people move, uh, chop wood, um, even anoint for illness, uh, visit, mow, mow grass, uh, do uh, some of the chores and repair work. Not too much repair work. I'm not a, a super handyman, but I can be grunt labor. Um, I was somewhat oblivious to the amount of information that flows to you as a pastor. And what's recorded here was, a, you know, in, in Acts 6 is a real gap in the New Testament church for tending to the physical needs of the members that still exist today. These opportunities for service and for help in the congregation still exist today. And in Acts 5... And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Well, why did it please the church? Well, because they were involved in the process. Their opinion was valued. Uh, men and women were chosen who the congregation knew were already serving them. Uh, they were already doing the job. And the 12 disciples went to the membership and asked the membership for their counsel on this. Spiritual consensus works, and the members were pleased because there was caring and godly 
leadership from the 12. Acts 15, if you turn there, Acts 15, we'll just read three scriptures there. Uh, here in Acts 15, we, we see something that, that still happens today, time to time. Uh, Mr. Shaby set the theme of the GCE this year as uh, speaking the same thing, speaking the same thing. Uh, and Acts 15 kind of speaks to this uh, principle. Acts 15, beginning in verse 1, a certain, uh, a certain man uh, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had uh, no small uh, dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So did you catch what was in there? The context is they, the local congregation, the brethren, said, you need, you guys all need to go to Jerusalem, to home office, to headquarters, and settle this. You, you, you need to get this settled. And in verse 3, so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, um, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Now, it could also mean here that the church paid their way to go to Jerusalem as well, but the context is they, the church, wanted this resolved. It caused great joy to all the brethren to have everyone speaking the same thing. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 2. Let's go back now to 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. Let's go back uh, to see uh, this and see what the context is of what I brought up earlier, um, where it says you do not need uh, that anyone teach you. Remember, we talked about populism, uh, an anti-establishment type movement that we see raging through the country, the world, uh, today, um, and we're going back. Uh, I'm going to back up to verse 18. Uh, this is the Apostle John in his senior years, and there's uh, some trouble in the church uh, that he describes as Antichrist. John is the only writer that that uh, uses uh, this particular word, and the word can kind of hijack our thoughts a little bit because we're used to. Uh, hearing this in regard to end time events and revelation, uh, but this term is often misused or used exclusively by some uh, for that end time period. And here John uses the term antichrist, and antichrist simply means an opposer of Christ, one who usurps the place of Christ. And there were all sorts of false doctrines going around, and unfortunately people tended to bring them into the church and try to persuade others. And so John is addressing this. And I'm going to read again out of the New Living Translation. Again, as I read uh, uh, this uh, verse 27 in 1 John 2 earlier uh, because of the plain language. We're going to start in verse 18 of 1 John 2. It says, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. For this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. But you are not like that. For the Holy One has given you His Spirit, and all of you know the truth. So I am writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. Verse 22, and who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. And anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. 
Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. Anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he has promised us. I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. And so the context here that John is writing to the church about is to be on guard about those who are outside the faith, who would try to deceive you by teaching things that are untrue, that are not biblical, not like Christ taught, not the truth. If they were of the truth, they would be in the body of Christ. And then in verse 27, as we read at the beginning of the message, John reminds them, but you have received the Holy Spirit, and it lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what it teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as it has taught you, remain in the fellowship with Christ. So does this mean we do not need teachers in the church? Well, then why the body of evidence about pastors and teachers and structure in the church? There's so much evidence to support the coming together, the congregating. It's hard to speak the truth in love and pursue unity and peace if it's the church of one. Who will you speak the truth in love to? Who will you pursue unity in the body with? Um, no, God intended the physical structure made up of physical human beings to come together, to actively need to use the spirit that he gives to grow into the fullness of Christ. We can't learn to edify the body if we're not a part of it. I can tell you in my life, the church body has had a profound effect on me personally, a significant influence on our children. And this impact is more than just uh, hand-me-down clothes, uh, furniture, a uh, loaner car when our car broke down, uh, food, cash when we needed it, uh, when it was desperately needed, uh, helping us move many, 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 many times. Um, those physical blessings are wonderful, and it's great to have family when those needs come, family that's willing and happy to help. But the spiritual help is the most impactful. Having brothers and sisters who have been in the faith for years to draw upon their wisdom, to encourage us along the way, this is something I cannot place a personal value on. To have the purposeful and love-filled prayers of my brothers and sisters in Christ has been a great blessing to us through the years. And I suspect many of you feel very much the same. 1 John 2, verse 28, And now, dear children, remain in the fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. Well, I'm going to wrap this up today, and I hope I didn't trample too much on tomorrow's messages, but I hope there was enough um, teasing of your mind spiritually, some enough, enough insight to make ourselves aware of this world's tendency for 
populism, uh, an anti-establishment movement that has been that has really caused that's really caused by those in power using their authority in an authoritarian way, causing you know widespread mistrust of structure, rule of law, and even proper use of God-given authority. This mindset is currently prevalent, and we see it. We recognize it. It's the zeitgeist of our age. Will the people of God during the end time allow this mindset to corrupt the ideals and principles of God and bring disunity, mistrust, and conflict into the church? Time will tell. As 1 Corinthians 2.12 exhorts, and the day of Pentecost certainly reminds us, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. God has given to us perfect leadership in Jesus Christ. He has given us his spirit and formed a physical and a spiritual church, a body for our edification, for our personal benefit, so that we have a place to practice speaking and living the truth in love with each other. Let's resist, brethren, the spirit of the world and its false teaching and wrong way of thinking and protect and demand the integrity of the church by using the gifts that God's Spirit gives us. And the gifts that God freely gives each one of us to bind us together as one body as we work toward becoming the fullness of Christ.